Hey, it's Steve. This is the first video in a series on building an N-scale switching layout in a portable wooden case that runs on DCC and contains a storage drawer to hold the controller, cables, and rolling stock. This video will cover the construction of the case, the installation of the track and wiring, and the first test runs. While the layout will have structures and scenery added eventually, uh, that will be covered in a later video. I'm actually considering making modular structures and scenery panels for this layout that will attach with magnets so I can swap out industries and other features to match what type of operating session I want to hold. And that should be interesting, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss future videos on this project. First off, here is a quick look at the pieces I needed to build the layout. I did use a five foot long piece of one by two pine that isn't pictured here, and I also didn't use all the hardware shown at the bottom, but did end up using a couple of handles that aren't shown that I already had left over from other projects. I also used a pneumatic door stay to help keep the lid of the case open during operating sessions. All of the clear pine I purchased was in six foot and eight foot long lengths, so the first step was measuring and cutting all the required pieces to length. While I do have a chop saw, I cut everything using a handheld circular saw and a speed square. By holding the speed square tight against the edge of the board and using it as a guide, you can still get nice square cuts even when cutting by hand. Here is the same picture I showed earlier, but with notes on where each of the pieces were used and also notes on the length and width of the pieces. Note that the exact measurements will depend on the width and thickness of your particular lumber. That top lid and main layout base were 12 inch pine, which means they were really just over 11 inches in actual width. In retrospect, it might have been better to use 3 quarter inch birch plywood for the lid top and layout base in order to make it a full 12 inches wide. The top lid was a full 5 feet or 60 inches long, while the main layout base was 1.5 inches shorter to account for the thickness of the side pieces. My office desk is 60 inches long, and so I wanted this layout to fit on the desk if I decide to operate the layout in my office. The back of the layout is a piece of 1 by 8 inch pine, while the front is composed of two pieces of 1 by 4 inch pine, plus a 1 by 2 pine board that isn't shown, but is used to fill the remaining gap and also acts as a handle to lift the lid. The short 11 and a quarter inch pieces of wood used on the underside of the layout are all made from 1 by 3 inch pine boards. I assembled the layout case with glue and screws, and I favor GRK fasteners or similar since it is nearly impossible to strip the head on them. I clamped some of the 1x3 pine boards to the back of the layout to help line up where I wanted the layout base to be attached, and the layout base board was then glued and screwed to the, to the layout back. Next, I shifted the 1x3 boards to help prop up the layout side so I could glue and screw those in place as well. I also glued and screwed in a piece of 1x3 on the inside bottom of the layout on each edge to help support the bottom of the base and provide a thicker side on the bottom to which I could later attach adjustable feet and not have to worry about them sticking out beyond the edge of the layout. My wood was warped in various directions so this extra board also helped to securely attach the main layout base to the board and keep it straight. I got the other side attached and then started marking out where I wanted the front boards to go and where I wanted the drawer to be situated. Once I figured out where I wanted the drawer to be located, I could attach more support pieces on the bottom of the layout, and those not only helped to stiffen and flatten the layout base, but it also would serve as places to secure the drawer slides later on during the construction. I then cut the front trim piece where I wanted the drawer to be, and ending up with three sections, the left and right sides, plus the actual drawer front itself. When working on the layout top, I hadn't noticed the camera had fallen forward and was pointing at the floor, and so I wasn't able to video the assembly of the lid. But it is just a 1x4 piece of pine attached to one edge of a 60 inch long piece of 1x12 pine, and a 1x2 inch pine board then attached at a 90 degree angle to the bottom of that 1x4. I attached the lid to the layout case using a 40 inch long piano hinge, roughly centered on the back of the layout. And this piano hinge was attached with a couple dozen screws, so it does make for a pretty secure connection. I did need a way to keep the lid open since it was front heavy and would tend to fall shut. And I tried using different locking mechanisms, but all of them failed and this really wouldn't help to keep the lid open the way I wanted. So I jumped on Amazon and ordered a couple different door lift stays to help hold the lid open, as well as some toggle latches to help hold the lid closed during storage and transport. 
While I waited for those to arrive, I worked on the front of the layout case. I glued and nailed the front trim of the layout in place on either side of the drawer opening, and then I worked on attaching the drawer slides. The drawer slides I used are 12 inches long and were the shortest I found at Home Depot. Since the layout baseboard is only 11 and a quarter inches wide, I needed to cut notches in the back of the layout to accommodate the back end of the drawer slides. The 1x8 on the back is 3 quarter inches thick, and so the combination of the back panel plus the actual layout board itself does make for a 12 inch deep case and the needed 12 inch length to fit the drawer slides. I used my circular saw to cut the notches to the right depth and then finished knocking them out with a chisel. I used a couple clamps to hold each drawer slide in place while I screwed them to keep them level and in the orientation I needed. Next, I built the drawer box out of two pieces of 1x3 and two pieces of 1x2 pine. I had already cut out those 1x3 pieces earlier on, and so I just needed to cut the 1x2 pieces for the front and back of the drawer long enough to make sure the drawer would be wide enough to fit in between the drawer slides, but not so wide that it would be a tight fit, making the drawer hard to open. I also screwed the inner side of the drawer slide to the sides of the drawer box and then attached the front trim piece to the front end of the drawer with a few screws. While I still needed to add a bottom to the drawer, the Amazon Prime truck showed up with my door stays and so I decided to work on those next. The pneumatic ones looked to clearly be a better choice since the folding arm version I also picked up would take up too much space on the side of the layout in the closed position. They fold down as you close the lid and so I wouldn't be able to put anything on the sides of the layout near them because they would basically crush anything as the lid came down. The pneumatic stays don't drop any lower where you attach them when they are in the closed position, so you don't have to worry about them eventually damaging any scenery. Also, the stays I picked up could hold a lot of weight, and I only needed to use one of them to help keep the lid open. The instructions tell you where you need to install the brackets that hold the pneumatic piston arm, and those just attach with a few screws each, and then you can just snap on the piston arm itself and you are good to go. I'll definitely use these on future projects as well, since I do have some extras. At this point, it was time to sand the layout case smooth and get it ready for staining. I sanded the layout with a coarse and then a fine grit sanding disc, and then went back and filled in all the nail and screw holes with some wood putty. While I was waiting for that wood putty to dry, I worked on making the bottom of the drawer. I cut a piece of cardboard down until it was the right fit to fit the bottom of the drawer, and then I used that as a template to cut out a piece of 1 8 inch plywood. Once that was cut to size and sanded a bit, it was ready to attach with a few screws. I sanded the bottom of the drawer and then went back and sanded the rest of the layout again to smooth out all the spots where I had used the wood putty. After wiping all the dust off the layout, it was time to apply a nice cherry stain. I stained the inside and outside of the layout case, but if you are going to add scenery right away, you don't really need to stain the inside. But doing the inside does give a nice finished look and it makes it more enjoyable to use before structures and scenery are later added. After staining, I attached the toggle latches on each side of the lid, and then attached a handle onto the front of the drawer. The handle isn't really needed, but I liked the look of it, and so I went ahead and added it. Finally, I attached a carry handle to the front of the lid to use when transporting the layout, and it also acts as a nice handle to use when opening the lid. I put the handle in the middle, but the layout isn't actually quite balanced since the side with the drawer is heavier, and so that does make it a little bit awkward to carry, but it isn't too bad. Anyway, here you can see the mostly finished case. I'll still need to put on a few coats of polyurethane on the case, but I'll wait until after the layout project is pretty much done before I go ahead and do that in case I have to touch up the stain or wood in different areas. So for this layout, I'm using an NCE power cab to control things, and I think it makes a nice choice for a layout like this if you want to go DCC. In the basic package, you get the hand controller, a panel you can mount on your layout fascia that you can plug everything into, the AC power supply unit, and a plug with screw terminals to which you can connect the wires from the track on your layout. Cables to connect your hand controller to the layout panel are of course also included. The power cab is a little different from other DCC hand controllers in that the power cab hand controller also serves as a DCC base station and contains all of the electronics. Thus it is a larger unit than the basic hand controllers you might have in a Digitrax or other system but it is still comfortable to hold and use, and overall, this is really a great system for smaller layouts. To mount the panel to the front of the layout, I drilled a few holes and then chiseled out the opening to the correct size I needed to actually fit the panel in place. 
And curiously, the box didn't come with any screws to attach the panel to the layout, but I had plenty of small screws that would work fine, so it really wasn't an issue for me. I didn't want to plug the power supply directly into the back of the panel though, since that would be kind of awkward to do if the layout was sitting on a table, as you would have to tip it up to reach and access the plug, and then the layout might crush the power cable when it was actually put back down. But luckily I had another plug of the same size as the one on the power cab panel, and so I soldered on some wires to the terminals on the power port of that panel, and then I ran those to the back corner of the layout where I could put the other power plug port. I drilled a hole through the back corner of the layout case, chiseled it out large enough to fit the kind of uh, odd shape of the plug itself, and then fed the wires through that that I had soldered onto the main panel. Then I soldered those wires onto the extra power port plug, added some hot glue to the hole to hold the plug in place, pushed the power port in, and then filled in the little gaps around the edges with some wood putty. Finally, it was time to install the track on the layout. I picked up a load of Kato Unitrack for the project, unpacked the track, and assembled it per my track plan, which you can see here as well. I'll have a listing of the track used in the video description as well as in the blog post that accompanies this video. Once I had the track laid out, I needed to drill holes for the turnout wires as well as the power leads for the track. I added power connectors on the ends of each track as well as between the turnouts in the middle to hopefully prevent any dead areas on the layout. The Kato turnouts are power routing, so it might be possible to just have two sets of power leads in the middle of the layout and power everything that way, but I would rather not have to rely on the turnouts to supply power to each track. I marked the location of each hole, drilled the holes, cleaned up the mess, and then replaced the track on the layout. I fed the wires through the holes and then removed the rail joiners where I wanted to attach the wired unit joiners. I did eventually have to solder on a pair of wires directly to the rail itself on the end of one track section because I accidentally pulled off the wires from one of the sets of wired unit joiners. And of course it's a lot cheaper to just solder all the wires in place and not use unit joiners at all, but the wired unit joiners are fast and convenient to use as long as you don't break them. Now I had the bad idea to attach the track by putting hot glue in all the holes where I fed the wires through and that would help to hold down the track. The idea was that I could put the glue in each hole and then hold the wires taut to keep the track flush against the wood. Now that would have worked really well had I done that long enough to let the glue fully dry, but unfortunately in a few spots I found the track had pulled away before the glue had fully set, and that created a few little raised areas that caused the cars to uncouple during testing. And so the solution was to scrape away as much glue as I could in those areas and then squirt some more hot glue under the track in the raised areas. The new hot glue melted the old hot glue and then I could just press down on the track in that area until the glue was set again and that flattened and secured the raised areas that were causing those problems. While I connected two sets of wires to the DCC system for initial testing, I still needed to go through and redo all the wiring for long-term use. And remote turnout operation isn't really needed on a layout this small when your hand is really never more than about a foot away from any turnout during an operating session, but I went ahead and added remote control push buttons anyway. Uh, since the Kato turnouts have those built-in switch motors, it kind of felt like a waste to not use them, so I picked up two of the Digitrax DS74 units and more of the push buttons I used on my previous 3.5 by 5.5 foot end scale layout project to control those turnouts. Now you might think that you can't use Digitrax DS74 units with an NCE power cab, but you can, and I found that I've had no issues whatsoever using them together, at least in this application. These DS74 units work like the DS64 units that I had used in the past, except that they now have a pin connector to which you attach your ribbon cable instead of additional screw terminals for those wires. There is a set of terminals to connect the DCC power to, four sets of terminals to connect the switch machine motors to, a common power wire that supplies power to your push buttons or whatever other controllers you're using, and then the ribbon cable connector to which you can attach the other push button wires, sensors, or whatever else you plan to attach to these units. First off, I needed to drill six holes for the push button controllers, and so I marked out the spots for the buttons so they were evenly spaced. I drilled a set of small pilot holes, and then I used a step bit to bore out the holes to the needed three quarter inch diameter. The step bit is actually designed to be used on sheet metal, but that makes it produce a really nice smooth hole in wood, as you can see here. And a regular three quarter inch wood drill bit would make a much more ragged hole, but you could still use one if you're careful enough. 
I then pulled a bunch of wires to connect to the buttons, and I tried to select wire colors that generally match those on the ribbon cable that connects to the DS74 unit, so it'd be pretty much the same wire color from the connector all the way to the button, making it easier to track down any future wiring problems. First though, I connected the common power wire to the button, simply daisy chaining them all together instead of connecting six individual separate wires. I then connected a second wire from each push button to the appropriate spot on the ribbon cable uh, on either of the two DS74 units. The DS74 instructions show you which color wire on the ribbon cable connects to which switch machine terminal. The diagram here shows how I wired everything together, and I connected four turnouts to one DS74 unit and then two turnouts to the other since each can only handle four turnouts, but note that the common power wire going to the buttons was actually just from one single DS74 unit. It doesn't really matter which unit the buttons are wired to for the common wire, only the second wire matters as that is the one that actually determines which turnout the button will operate. The cool thing about these units is that you only need to use one button for each turnout. Each button press will throw the turnout in the opposite direction from which it is currently oriented. I tested all the buttons to make sure I heard a turnout operating with each push. And one thing I quickly learned though was that since these are solenoid type switch machines, the DS74 unit wouldn't be able to power them if you hit the buttons in rapid succession. Sometimes it would take a second or two for the turnout to actually throw, since the capacitors in the DS74 unit needed to recharge before being able to send enough current to operate the turnout. And that's only an issue if you push a bunch of buttons one after the other during normal use where you're just doing one at a time, it's not an issue. With everything working correctly, I soldered all the wire connections and then used some heat shrink tubing to cover the connections or just wrap them in electrical tape. I didn't have enough of the heat shrink tubing of the right size that I needed, and my liquid electrical tape had pretty much hardened up on me, so I had to resort to electrical tape at this point in time to cover all the connections. And I'll probably go back and redo a lot of those with either heat shrink tubing or just get more of that liquid electrical tape and paint that on all the connections at a later time. And once the wiring was complete, it was time to add some panels to cover the bottom of the layout. And so I cut a bunch of small sections of 1x2 pine to help support those bottom panels and to provide a place to screw the panel into. I attached each of the wood blocks with glue and a couple of wood screws, and then I just screwed on the bottom panels. I of course didn't use any glue on those panels since I'll have to eventually remove those anytime I need to access the wiring. And so once the panels were in place, I stained them with the same cherry stain I used on the rest of the layout. Next, it was time to finish up the drawer. I cut two pieces of foam to the size I needed that I actually stole out of one of my Pelican cases that I currently use for carrying astronomy gear. One is a thin piece that goes on the bottom and the other is a thicker piece that will be cut to hold the controller and the rolling stock. With both pieces of foam in the drawer, I played with different arrangements for all the items. And it was at this point that I wish I had really made the drawer a few inches wider so I'll be able to hold more pieces of rolling stock. And once I decided on the placement, I traced around each object with a knife to score the foam, and then cut through the foam with the knife after pulling it out of the drawer so I didn't cut through that bottom layer of foam. And that whole process is a bit tedious, so after cutting a few of the openings, I worked on adding a piece of cove molding to the back of the layout case to cover up the exposed wires there. And this is basically just a square piece of pine with one corner cut off, and so I just glued the strip of molding in place, and then tacked it in with a few finished nails to hold it while the glue dried. I covered the nail holes with a bit of wood putty, and then while waiting for that to dry, I worked on adding some adjustable feet to the bottom of the layout. Those little adjustable feet have a threaded plastic insert that is pressed into the hole that you have to drill for each one of them, and then the feet screw into those plastic inserts. This way you can adjust the height of each foot by either just screwing it in farther or unscrewing it a little bit, and that can help you keep the layout nice and level so your rolling stock isn't going one way or another on the layout if you have it on an uneven surface. And finally, I stained the strip of wood on the inside of the layout case and finished cutting out the foam in the drawer to hold everything, and the layout was pretty much ready to use. It's really nice having everything in a self-contained layout case, and setting up and taking down the layout only takes a couple of minutes. This has been a fun project so far, and in the next video in this series, I'll work on adding structures and scenery. As I said at the start of the video, I'm thinking about making the buildings on separate panels that can be removed from the layout and probably held in place with magnets. 
I'll also probably have individual scenery panels that I can kind of swap and move around as well. And the whole idea is that I can move the structures around and change them out to kind of suit the operating session that I'm trying to hold. A warehouse could be swapped out with a food processing plant or maybe a plastics manufacturer or something else uh, to allow for different operating sessions. Anyway, thanks for watching, and be sure to check out the video description for a link to the blog version of this video, as well as links to some of the products and tools that I used in this video. But that's all for now, and have a great day. Bye.